they were showing us storyboards, and I'm like, you want me to work on that? <laughs> <laughs> I pushed really hard to rebuild this in CG. Wow. You know, no joke. What? You know, the filmmakers, like when we started showing them stuff, they couldn't believe it. So you worked on one of the most iconic visual effects shots of modern cinema, in my opinion. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring this episode. Stick around to the end to see how you can get a free trial for a month. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artists React. We're joined by a very special guest today, Brian Grill. Brian is a visual effects supervisor, artist, compositor, he's done it all. Brian, tell us a little bit about what it means to be a visual effects supervisor. On set, you work directly with um, the filmmakers. And then for me, for example, I work for a company called Scanline. After filming, I come back and then I have a, a team of artists that I work with. You know, we can get up to 150 artists. You're, you're basically not only, you know, trying to keep a, a technical, a creative vision, but also, you know, you have a crew of people you got to keep motivated, you know, get to the end, uh, make the filmmakers happy. Brian, so what are some of the earliest projects that you worked on? I'm an old guy, been around. <laughs> I started uh, at Digital Domain, Apollo 13, Fifth Element, and Titanic were the first three movies I worked on. You know, I started as a compositing artist and uh, very fortunate that Digital Domain at the time was writing uh, Nuke. And then Nuke just became this tool, you know, and now the whole industry, it's like it's bread and butter. I can't wait to see you break down some of the iconic scenes you've worked on, as well as just kind of helping us understand how the technology in the, the world of visual effects have changed from the 90s all the way till now. So you worked on one of the most iconic visual effects shots of modern cinema, in my opinion. I mean, there's a couple. You know, you get the, the bullet time spin. Right. You got, I really just the bullet time spin. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also because it has one of the most iconic visual effects breakdowns, in my opinion. Like at the time this came out, right. my God, my God. What's cool about this, it's, this is one of the last movies I worked on that was uh, miniatures hmm. and CG together. Like these miniatures were shot at ILM uh, and then we, you know, added all our CG. Look at that, that's, that's a model. And then we add, that's uh, CG splinters. <laughs> I just, it, it, I love how he takes his hand off the railing and then it finally disappears. Yeah, no, because to your point, like, I just love that he is just in such bewilderment that yeah. he can't believe that this is happening and he doesn't even flinch. Like, yeah. you know, his hand goes on the railing and r the railing right behind, r right where he touched, just <laughs> obliterates. Yeah. And that's what makes it, I think, iconic is the, that performance. Like, like the fingers still yeah. out as if he's continuing it, yeah. What I notice when I watch it is that in every single shot, the destruction always starts in the very back of uh -huh. the shot and works its way to towards camera. Even if you flip the camera there, it comes towards us. You flip it there, it comes towards us. And it always follows that pattern, which is super smart because then you get to see everything. Nothing, right. It's not like something blows up in the foreground and you're like, what? It just covers everything. Like, <laughs> what, what, what's happening back there? <laughs> so what's real and what's not? Okay, so the, they built the, the, the set, and it was basically like balsa wood. We broke this up into, <laughs> into multiple passes. So we, we did a clean version where he walks down, you know, where nothing is blowing up. Then we, uh, for safety reasons, he couldn't be, you know, there. <laughs> what what, what, when, what, what when kind the, of safety reasons were, you, you, what was the safety challenge? You know, the have shot? you ever got a splinter? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Those splinters, hurt okay and especially if you so don't get all like, of it this would be like two or three yeah, splinters at the same time totally <laughs> they had charges and it was a motion control camera so the the camera was moving super fast it's just going <laughs> <laughs> yeah but shooting at super high rate oh so so basically so motion control rigs usually are to match two shots with a similar angle, but this was also retiming the speed of the rig to account for the frame rate right. that it's being filmed at so it can match the camera, except one's in slow motion 
and one's not. Right, so it was multiple passes for the different uh, beats of destruction. And then we put all those passes together. And then we had to then digitally explode it. Wow. You know, no joke. What? That, like, that is incredible that that's CG. That looks so photoreal. When they shot it, it was timed. And I pushed really hard to rebuild this in CG so that we could retime it and create these events. Mm -hmm. And we weren't locked in to what they shot on set. Like, the way that they animate the, the railing wiggling... Uh -huh. After it breaks to like show the flex and vibration still within it, yeah. that's like one of those touches where I mean I feel like I would I would totally miss that. I'm like boom, like sweet particles, cool shards, and then rendered, you know, done. But that that's that's what makes it look like a practical effect. And then also like because he wasn't there in the same uh, pass where the explosions were happening, we added in all the pieces that actually interact with him. It looks like he's uh, projected, camera projected. We did. Onto. So we didn't make him a full d digital asset, but we had a 3D representation of him and we reprojected. We needed the 3D for the things to bounce off of him, but also we were able to change the lighting Mm. because he's walking downstairs where there's no smoke, there's no debris around him. So we were creating shadows. Oh, that's, that's not good. So you worked on a film called Free Guy. It was with Scanline. I imagine you guys did a lot of destruction. <laughs> there's just so much stuff happening. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so crazy to watch. You know, we actually shot in Boston, uh, Camaro on a street. And uh, we use that as our, basically our reference. And we, you know, tried to honor that as closely as possible. You know, what you, what you get when you're in a city is when the sun is reflecting, it bounces off the windows and then it puts reflection on the ground. And like, there's all these complexities. And that was kind of like what we were trying to achieve is first make it look like a city and, you know, add all those little things that make it real and then turn into a trash compactor, much, <laughs> much like uh, the scene in Star Wars, you know, where the walls are co caving in on them. And that's, I kind of, you know, always look at that. And that, that's been, that was the inspiration, at least for me. Everything pushes everything. Like mm. our visual effects artists, they built this thing called the Street Squeeze World Machine. <laughs> uh, and basically- Is that a plugin you can get on no, uh, for After I, Effects? I, I, I wish. <laughs> and basically, as the building moves, it uh, pushes the cement, the cement crumbles, the cement rolls over, it then gets to the street, the asphalt crumbles, it pushes the car, then the tree, you know, so it's like this happens, this happens, and then our team was able to build this thing that had all the dynamics built in, wow. and then uh, on top of that, we could uh, animate any section of it, have a tree fall, or, you know, animate the car to, you know, feel like it has more shocks. You know, at the end of the day, we had a lot of control over the sequence and you know the filmmakers like when we started showing them stuff they couldn't believe it like it, <laughs> usually when you you do a movie you start cutting it you know all the pieces shorter and shorter and they were coming back to us and like can you add some more frames like we don't have enough handles <laughs> you know and, and which was a compliment <laughs> you know they used every frame because you know they didn't realize at the end of the day it was like Whoa, that's really what it looks like. <laughs> that's cool. So if, if this is all like in one file, like how do you work on that? How, do, how does an artist like work through that process? You know, for a 3D artist, you know, sometimes it takes 15, 20 minutes just yeah. to load a scene. <laughs> <laughs> that shot's, I think, a good example of like, all right, we're, we're going to break the file up a little bit here where we have our main area where everything's interacting. Right. And then all the stuff that's not close to camera where we're not going to have lighting shifts, we can push that back and have exactly. separate passes of that. You bring up a really good point, because what saved us and what got us through is we had this thing called the jump camera. And basically we would take the first, middle, last frame and we would render it every night. Hmm. And then we would basically look at it and we can tell like what's in the back, like what's important. And instead of building this high res street, you know, for 12 blocks, which is what this street is, we basically look through the jump camera and go, okay, what is the high res element that we need? And we focused on just on a per shot basis, what, what it was that we had to focus on and build and, you know, put the effort into. Ready? I see it. 
like this movie for me, it, you know, this and like Roland Emmerich movies, mm -hmm. like I'm my four year old kid. <laughs> Yeah, I was one of those kids. I, I had a Super 8 camera, and I would take firecrackers. I'd build a model, and then I'd shoot it blowing up, you know, or put it on fire. Uh, and yep. that's kind of like, you know, this is the my version of doing that now. This is you getting paid to do that. <laughs> I want to ask you about water. So I feel like Scanline got its start with water simulations? Yeah. The owner of Scanline, Stefan Troyansky, he started as a coder and seeing all the Hollywood visual effects stuff, he's like, how do we stand out? And so he basically wrote uh, the water software, Flowline, and it's kind of been our base of what we do at Scanline because water is really hard. I, and I worked on Titanic and at the time it was like water, oh my God. You know, now you can buy off the shelf software that does water, but not only did Stefan write the software, but he also wrote the tools to break up the simulations on a hundred CPUs. Hmm. Whereas before you would have to run it on, you know, one machine, but he figured out how to simulate over multiple machines. And that's why you, it's all about that iteration, like, you know, that feedback. And that's how we get it closer to reality. When I worked on Titanic, you know, I was compositing one shot for three months straight and like i would six days hitting notes we'd film it out for for all of those people who are wondering what film it out means that means literally printing your render to film right yeah then get a whole round of notes and start all over again it would literally take a week to turn around the notes from the week before and if you don't check your render and then you're like oh here film it out i i mean i've had like things popping off and <laughs> like, and you don't want to be in that screening room with like Jim Cameron and all of a sudden you're like, okay, dailies. And then, oh, <laughs> who worked on this shot? And, mm. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a glitch in the hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what Scanline does is, you know, we, we've worked with water. We break it down. Like, you know, even the glints, the highlights, like the white water, you know, we are looking at reference constantly because you can never take anything for granted. One of the reasons I wanted to ask about water is clearly compared to like water from like when Air Force One crashes into the ocean. This is so much more advanced, but it's not photo real yet. Right. right. And in your opinion, what, do, what would it take to get this to be photo real? Well, I, I think making a lake, right? Mm -hmm. We can make that photo real. <laughs> but if you, you tell the water to bark like a dog, <laughs> you know, like this, we're making a tsunami uh, that's 100 feet tall. And, you know, there's definitely some creative license. I mean, a lot of this looks really real. Yeah, yeah but not to him. He, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that, like, I love that analogy about making the lake bark like a dog. That was perfect. <laughs> well, I did. Like, we, we, I worked on Stealth, which you guys <laughs> honored us with saying that it was some good CG. Our director, Rob Cohen, he wanted it. We showed him like the floating dirigible, and it was leaking fuel, and then it caught on fire. And literally, he's like, I want it to bark like a dog. <laughs> and we're all like looking at each other like, what? <laughs> it's like, I want that fire to, and so we were like, Rrr. like, so as it's coming, it's, Rrr. Rrr. Oh, you know, nice. uh, but those are the things you get, you know, bark like a dog or, you know, it looks CG or painterly, like all these things you have to like, okay, what does that mean? Like, I hate being on the, the, the other end of that note. Like when a director gives you like, look CG or looks painterly, how do I tell that to my artists? Yeah. Like they're looking at me like, okay, what's the note? Well, it's simple, <laughs> you, just, you turn on the painterly slider. Right. Oh, well, it was the oil paint filter he put over the whole day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That shot's incredible. There's just something about that one shot in particular that really stands out to me. Everyone, like the people in the cars on the bridge, it feels like they're reacting. Mo most of our job is like, how do we make it look real? Because this can never really happen. You know, strip down, what are the physics? Like you can look on YouTube and you see bridges where the wind is and the, you know, it, the engineering is weird. And then all of a sudden it starts moving. And so we were using that and then also the wires that hold it. So we're like, well, if it's one of those breaks, you know, and there's a chain reaction, you know, it would buckle. And you know, that's the fun part is like, okay, <laughs> what should it look like? You're like, cause there's no button that says simulate. And you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's like, you really like, 
you have to go through and you run it and then you're like, the beginning is cool, but I don't like it at the end, you know, and it's just iteration after iteration until finally you're like, okay, let's render this and see what it looks like. I, I worked on uh, GI Joe Rise of Cobra and we had to do the Eiffel Tower collapsing. We actually hired an engineering firm and basically said, how would this fall? Like what would happen? Where would it break? Where, where are the areas that will, you know, fail first? But that's the fun, like, you know, figuring all that stuff out. I know this would never happen, but if it did, how would it look? <laughs> this is one of the most difficult episodes for me to be a part of because I can't stop watching the footage. Like, I, I just get, keep getting sucked in. There's so much to watch. I love it. D destruction is such a fun thing to watch in films. And if you have any scenes from films where huge things blow up or things rip apart, let us know in the comments and we'll check them out. This was like, again, they were showing us the storyboards, the animatics of the sequence. And I'm like, you want me to work on that? That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I get to blow up uh, a mansion uh, on Point Doom in Malibu. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> they had storyboarded like this sequence and most of it is digital, you know, especially all the wide shots. We couldn't actually shoot plates around Point Doom because it's a, preserve or a national park and you can only get 500 feet away and so they came to us early before even shooting and said you know this has to be a full digital environment we did get in a helicopter and we did you know at 500 feet you know with the long lenses and basically reconstructed point doom using photogrammetry then building out the rest of the environment you know and they built a set that would collapse so that you know a lot of this was practical and then we were adding uh, obviously all the glass and uh, but that that was a real uh, really? hole that we just added all the you know the fine detail around it it was really complex so this shot right here yeah. i see all this detail you know all this environment work the rocks etc and the finished shot I really don't see much of that work anymore. Right. I just kind of see the glow. Right. Now, is that something where you guys built up the detail and as notes happen, it just kind of ended up like this? Or is that just something you have to do even though you know at the end you're gonna be putting so much haze and glow on it that you don't see much of the detail? One thing I have learned over the years, it's like if you take a, sh a plate and you put the background out of focus, like a lot of people are like, oh, well, it's gonna be out of focus. You don't have to put any detail. And that's <laughs> actually not correct because if you have something with no detail and put it out of focus it looks like crap but it, <laughs> but if it's real right mm -hmm. it has a lot of detail then you put it out of focus you it, it even though it's out of focus you see the complexity right if you have rocks and then all of a sudden it's out of focus it's all the detail in that real rock that makes it look like a real rock out of focus <laughs> <laughs> yeah um but for, for example, this, you know, the waters around uh, California, there's not a lot of clarity. Like, you, you, you know, you, you can only see so far before it starts clouding up and getting hazy. If everything was crystal clear, then it would really start looking fake. Mm -hmm. And so we made sure that we were creating the detail and then essentially hiding it. You know, I'm working on shots right now upstairs and sometimes have a, the, like a bad 3D model for the background, so I, I blur it more, and I'm right. like, it's not making it look better. No, I no. It, it still looks like crap, yeah. just blurry crap. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <sighs> Hey guys, did you know that Seth Rogen has a book? Well, thanks to today's sponsor, Audible, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. The book is called Yearbook, and it chronicles Seth Rogen's life from his childhood through his career, and he notably drops a lot of really interesting stories. Like, I had no idea just how intense of a thing that whole North Korea situation was, or how insane Nicolas Cage kind of is. <laughs> he has an insane story about Kanye West, too, and Tom Cruise. 
It's a very entertaining book. It actually plays out a lot like a show because he actually hires a whole bunch of his friends and actual real people to voice their characters in his book. But the only way you can hear that is by going to audible.com slash corridor crew or by texting corridor crew to 500 500. Audible is of course the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and it's all in one place. You can get the best sellers, the new releases. They've got a whole plus catalog as well. Kind of like a library card. They have a whole bunch of audiobooks that you can just get for free included in your membership. And of course you get one free book. Doesn't matter what book it is every single month. They've even got podcasts. In fact, Seth Rogen's podcast Storytime is here as well. I recommend that one too. And you can of course get started by going to audible.com slash quarter crew or just simply texting quarter crew to 500500. So thanks for sticking around through my favorite type of ad segment. But for now, let's get back to the couch. I'm going to transform into future Sam. <laughs> Brian, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Do you have any, do you have any advice for all the, uh, the visual effects artists or wannabe visual effects artists out there? You know, as cool as these shots look, there's a lot of hard work. And, you know, I'm just one person of a, out of a million, to be honest. And uh, it's a passion job and, you know, stick with it and have fun and take care of yourselves. You know, I'm a big fan of Bill and Ted, so be excellent to each other. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate you joining us on this no episode. No worries. It's been wonderful. You've had a bunch of amazing insights. I'm just I'm so fortunate to be able to be joined by guests like you who, honestly, you know, I've looked up to you and people like you for, for so long trying to get into doing visual effects. Well, it's only because you, I've never been on the bad CG side. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, uh, trust me, I wouldn't have come if I was on the bad CG. Yeah. I'd be like, no, you, you can work it out. <laughs>